he was just telling about all these different artists he was working on and there's all of the, them unsigned. And he played me about eight or nine things. And one of them was Phoebe Bridges. And of all the things he played me, and all of which were pretty good, she just stood out. Jordan, what's happening, Mike? What's up, Sam? Welcome back to New York, dude. Glad to have you back. Oh, I'm thrilled. Thrilled to be back, man. It, it was great living out in the mountains, but now now summer's popping off. We, we, ba- we backed up. We you, waxed up. It was good. Baby. <laughs> you, you shave. You don't got that. You don't got the hat and the glasses that made you look like you from the, from from out in the, in in, uh, in Wyoming anymore. You look like you look like a New Yorker again. So I, glad, I'm glad to have you back. I'm back, <laughs> baby. Back. Who we got lined up today? Today, we have the former CEO of Chrysalis Music and co-founder of Blue Raincoat Music, Jeremy Lascelles. So for those who don't know, get straight to the point. He played a role in signing or overseeing the signings of Outkast, CeeLo Green, Bonnie Vare, and most recently, or actually not super recently, but a huge name in music right now, Phoebe Bridgers. So he's worked in publishing, um, A&R, management, uh, label services, and honestly has just been a Swiss Army knife for the different companies that he's worked at um, and kind of been able to fill whatever role he's been uh, presented with. So a few things that I think are exciting about this episode is that we actually discuss imposter syndrome, which I think is very prevalent in the music industry. It's a very quote unquote cool industry. And some people don't feel quote unquote cool working in it. I know I've had it at some point. So we, we talk about imposter syndrome. We talk about identifying quality records and how that may differ from records you actually like, which is a super interesting part of the conversation. Um, and lastly, one of the things that I think is exciting is that we talked about the signing of, of Phoebe Bridges, a really big name in music right now. I think she has a lot of potential. So we get into how he discovered her and also um, David Gray's ascent after rejection, you know, getting dropped by three labels and, and still making a really great career for himself. So a lot of great things in this episode. What do you think, Sam? Yeah, I thought it was great. I mean, there's a lot of experience on both sides of the table, both as an artist manager, record label owner, operator, music publishing. So it was really cool to talk a little bit with him about uh, kind of the evolution of deal terms and just the general trend towards more equitable deal structures, as well as kind of things to really watch out for from an artist's perspective to ensure you're in a, in a great place and likely to get lots of support and growth by way of partnership with a label. Um, in that same vein, I mean, he's done JVs, acquisitions. I mean, he's partnered with lots of different corporate entities by way of his kind of entrepreneurial journey. Beyond that, I think he uh, has really great perspectives with regards to artist development, label operations. So tons of gems in this episode. Um, really excited. So do you just want to dive into it? If you haven't already, definitely be sure to check out our Patreon though. Um, it's going down in the discord. Uh, watch out. <laughs> Yo Gotti DMS are our, our last year, bro. Now, now it's going down in the discord. Um, so definitely check that out. You can go to musicbusinesspodcast.com slash community. We're looking to, we do host monthly happy hours, finding ways to help and support each of you in your journey, networking, promotion opportunities, all that good stuff. So, there you have it. Without any further ado, uh, Jeremy Lascelles. Jeremy, thank you so much for, for virtually coming out. We're really glad to have you on. Thank you for inviting me. Awesome. Um, so I guess before we, before we jump right into the details of your career, um, this is a question that we'd like to ask a lot of our guests, but uh, what do you think the three values are if you had to choose three values that have afforded you the most success uh, in the music industry? God, I think um, probably being... Truthful, um, being to the point, um, and trying to stay true to your own values and your own beliefs mm. more than anything else. Yeah. Um, I think like the music industry moves really quickly and it's very easy to change uh, what you think one day to the next if you're not rooted in a foundation of who you are as a person. So um, I totally agree with that. Um, can you talk about how you became the, the CEO of Chrysalis Records and, and how you then went on to launch uh, Blue Raincoat Music? Um, well, it's actually kind of the other way around, but um, just to give you a very quick summary, as quick as I can, I started as an artist manager when I was like 17 years old. Nice. Um, <clears throat> then became a tour manager. So I had the uh, experience of being traveling around the world with various artists. Um, I then, I think largely because of that experience, I got offered a job at Virgin Records because they wanted someone who kind of understood what it was like to be a band on the road and all that side of things. So I got offered a job in the A&R department. 
at Virgin Records in 1979. I thought I'd just do that for a few months. And I ended up staying there for 13 years till it got sold to EMI. Um, I then had a brief period where I kind of went out on my own again, went back into management. And then I got offered a job to run Chrysalis Music, which was the publishing arm of Chrysalis. The Chrysalis Records bit, having previously been sold to, to EMI, I'll come back on that. That story sort of circled <laughs> around on itself. Yeah. Uh, so I then joined Chrysalis Music to mainly run their music publishing activities. I knew nothing about music publishing at the time um, and probably don't know much more now, but you kind of make it up as you go along was the way I looked at it. Um, as I, I, did. I actually want to pause right there real quick. Yeah. So I think uh, the music industry is like a haven for imposter syndrome. There's a couple of industries um, that I think I think are are especially um, especially ripe for imposter syndrome. So you said you you started you you joined a music publishing company and kind of had to learn your way through it. What are some of the things that you told yourself to to give you confidence to do that for the people that may be going through that imposter syndrome right now? Um, specifically with music publishing. I thought if I don't know the rules, it's easier to break them and make new ones up. So I didn't think it was that important to be um, weighed down with the technicalities of what music mm. publishing entails. There are other people within the organization who, who knew that stuff and did it very well. I figured that if, if you talk to, um, you know, 10 different people in the industry about what they thought a music publisher did, most of them either went, I don't know, to not very much. So I thought right. that's, that's a pretty low bar to try and <laughs> rise above. Do you know what I mean? Right. And, and as, <clears throat> as someone who worked in a record company, I'd had um, interactions with music publishers. I didn't really, I couldn't figure out what the hell they did with their time and where they came in useful. <laughs> um, you know, so I thought, I've just got to, you know, I've got this gig now. I better do something to make a mark. So I thought, let's just try and be all things to all people and be, be there essentially to help artists in whatever it was they most needed help with at whatever stage of their career they were. So that meant that we took on a lot of different roles. Sometimes we ended up being the kind of quasi manager if they didn't have management, if a new act that we signed. Sometimes we acted as, as the kind of developing agents. Sometimes we made records and put them out. Sometimes we work very closely with record companies. We, it was just a different kind of role for each artist. And I kind of like that variety. And I like that mm -hmm. maverick quality of what, what I thought music publishing could be. And I, and I think the good fortune I had in this period, this was in the, the mid nineties. And as we moved towards the late nineties, um, you saw the consolidation of a lot of the major record companies. And as that happened, there's fewer and fewer of the indies, which is the world I'd come from, um, existed. It, the, the industry got very, very corporate and fewer and fewer chances were being taken on new artists. Mm -hmm. the, the art of development of just signing someone just because you thought they were great and taking your time before they are ready to, to, to hit the world. That was happening less and less within the major label system. And I saw that as an opportunity to take on that role as a publisher, because what difference does it matter what hat you're wearing? You know, you can still do the role that an artist required. So we did a lot right. of that with artists. And so we were able to find a kind of hole that suddenly developed, if you like, in the landscape of, of the industry and try and do some good work within it. Right. That's awesome. And then as kind of Blue Raincoats developed, I mean, that's now uh, operates as a management company, supports on the, the publishing side. Um, can you talk about the kind of development and launch there? Yeah, let me just uh, finish the take yeah, quick sure. story because there's always confusion about the various bits of Chrysalis yeah. that I've been involved in. So <laughs> the period I'm just talking about is Chrysalis Music, the, the music publishing mm -hmm. company. The Chrysalis Records had long been sold and was owned by EMI, mm -hmm. right? So this is put that in that little corner over there. Um, when Chrysalis Music came to the end of its existence, when it got bought by BMG in 2011, um, I took a little time out originally and then decided 
it was much more likely for me to, if I wanted to stay in, I, I thought for a while, to be honest, be, at that stage, I might just do something else in my life. But taking a year or two out, which is the first time I've done that since I was 17 years old, um, gave me a chance to kind of rethink and recharge the batteries. And I thought, music's what I know, it's what I love, and it's what I think I'm good at. So I thought I'd better start a, a new company. And I wanted it to be a mixture of, of everything. At that, that stage, you've got to remember, this was in 20, I was planning this in about 2012, 2013. Um, we launched the business in 2014. At that point, the whole music landscape was in a mess. Streaming had not yet been invented, if you like. The record companies were in turmoil. The value of copyrights was up in the air. No one knew which way to turn. But what was happening amidst all this was that there was a very strong um, expansion of, of the live music industry. So. People were going on the road to, to earn a living. Artists were no longer making records, making money from well, their record royalties, but they're making a lot of money for being on the road. So I wanted to just be in a place for this new company where I didn't want to put all my eggs in one basket. I didn't want to be just a, 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 a record label. I didn't want to be just a music publishing company. I didn't want to be just an artist management business. I wanted to be all three mixed together in some way that I thought was kind of relevant and fit for purpose in that era. So that was, from that idea um, was born Blue Raincoat Music. Um, probably the smartest decision I made at that process was to ask someone I knew quite well, but not super well, but always had respect for a guy called Robin Miller, who was a brilliant, um, brilliant thinker, famous for being a record producer, made all the early Sade records, various other things. And I always thought Robin's a smart brain, very good business brain. And I asked him if he'd come and do this crazy new venture with me. So we've been partners and, and without him, I don't think we'd have gotten anywhere near where we are now. We're a very good match for each other. Um, but um, so that was how Blue Raincoat Music was born. Um, at the heart of our um, business model, was always the notion that we'd buy a catalog of something, whether it's music publishing or, or recorded music. And when the opportunity came along right. in 2016 for us to buy Chrysalis Records, remember this is the bit that I had nothing to do with before, the bit that had been sold EMI in 1990, I think it was. Um, we had the opportunity to buy the brand and most of its catalog. And that was our sort of hallelujah moment. That was the moment when we thought we've got some scale now, we've got a great catalog of classic recordings. That's how we can build a business <laughs> around that as our kind of uh, our kind of anchor. So that's how the Christmas <laughs> records bit came back to my story. You know, so there's a lot of chrysalises, not all connected, mm -hmm. and I've been involved with all aspects of of, of chrysalises, <laughs> recorded music, and music publishing. Um, activities, but in the wrong order and never at the same time. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And then, I mean, in yeah. 2019, Reservoir acquired Blue Raincoat, correct? They bought um, the Chrysalis Records um, catalog. Okay. Which was, which is Blue Raincoat Music was the parent company for, for that part of our business. So, um, but we also um, did three joint venture businesses with Reservoir at the same time, or either continued what we were doing as joint ventures or started uh, a new joint venture. And at the heart of, of all that was our um, desire to want to open Chrysalis Records up as a frontline label again. Mm. And it was very difficult. I didn't want to do that until I thought we could do it properly. I thought we had the right sort of resources um, and the deal we made with Reservoir allowed that to happen. So the, the new Chrysalis Records activities, the new records we put out, our artist management business and a new music publishing business we started are all joint ventures with Reservoir. That's awesome. And it seems like, I mean, lots of kind of partnerships and subsidiaries um, throughout your career, different organizations. Um, when, you, when you think about that kind of from like a business operations level, like what are you really looking for and evaluating for 
we're trying to find that that perfect partnership. So it's it's something that can really enable business growth and take you to the next phase of the business. I was like literally thinking that same question. <laughs> we're, we're, we're on the same, literally the same question. <laughs> um, I don't think there's one sort of simple answer to that. I think it's a question of trying to analyze what you felt the business required at any given moment in time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that in the indie world, strength in depth is often important. Um, and recognizing what you can and can't do on your own is important and trying to look at things that you might be able to do a whole lot more effectively if you're in partnership with with other people and the the reason we wanted to be in business with reservoir is we wanted uh, we needed some to put it bluntly we needed some capital investment in our business we needed some some headroom some room to grow we were sort of we were kind of doing all right at that point but we were treading water. We were, we, we were not really able to see how we were going to significantly be able to expand our business. The, when we were introduced to Reservoir and started to get to know each other, I figured, Robin and myself figured they would be very good partners. They had um, you know, a long-term vision. They were not jumping onto something to jump out again. Um, we had specifically as a company and as individuals strengths and skills that they didn't have, which I thought is always a good compliment. There's no point in really going into partnership with someone who already do what you do, because then you're kind of, there's going to be something's going to give in that circumstance. So it was a very, very good match in all those areas. And um, uh, we've been working together for coming up two years now, and and, um, it's been a, a very fruitful, productive, and happy relationship so far. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so I want to dive a little bit deeper into the signing and, and um, finding artists sort of side of things. So yeah. um, we were told that signing and recording artists for you is your first love. So that kind of reminds me of, um, you know, when you're, you know, everybody I feel like is an A&R to some degree, right? Like we all choose music that we listen to on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, but what do you think are some traits and characteristics that are important for signing successful artists? And how did those qualities manifest themselves beforehand? So, you know, we hear about people, a rs that used to share mixtapes with their friends. They were sort of like the tastemakers before the tastemakers. What are some characteristics that think make, make you successful in finding artists? And, and how did those kind of manifest over time? Gosh, that's a good question, and I don't know how to run through it. Um, <laughs> yes, <I'm kidding. laughs> I think I think the important thing, and I, I try to look back a little bit. I'm not a big one on looking back, but it is helpful to do from time to time. I look back on mm-hmm. some of the things that I signed, and the the consistent pattern really is is just a belief in the absolute quality of that artist at a recognition that that artist's ambitions for themselves match or exceed yours for them, if you see what I mean. Mm. Um, so, um, and I've often, for not deliberately, signed artists that have been completely sort of, you know, out of cycle in terms of being, being kind of trendy and, 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 you know, what everyone else was listening to or buying at that, at that point, but I just, I kind of have a very naive and simple belief that quality will win through. And mm-hmm. um, sometimes you have to be patient. Everyone likes a quick and easy win, but the truth is those are few and far between. Um, a lot of my successes have been things that have happened over a much longer period of time that you have to sit and be patient with and, and ride it out and wait for that moment uh, when you get your break and everyone needs a break at some point, you know, it's, I mean, in, in life, we all need breaks, don't we, to, to get what we, we want. But, you know, the old sporting adage, the, the harder you practice, the luckier you get, you know, I sort of believe in that. Yeah. In what we that's, do, that's, that's a good what quote. We do with, our, with our, you know, how we go about running our businesses in the same way. So um, I just have to, we're not, we're not, I have to love something and understand it 
and understand where I think it can reach an audience. I mean, I'm not interested in signing someone who's going to sell, who I don't think is going to ever sell more than 10 copies. <laughs> you know, um, you've got to believe that there, there is an audience for them and you've got to have a, a sense of what that audience is and how you can get to them. Um, so those have been kind of my beliefs. And when, when I'm sort of running, when I was running a bigger department, whether it was the NR department at Virgin Records, where I was for a number of years, or then running Chrysalis Music, um, we are running a much broader um, church of, of musical styles and genres. Um, and I took the view then that it wasn't always important that I personally loved the artists that we signed, but as long as one of my A&R people did all the things I just described, absolutely believed in the artists and had a vision to how they could find an audience. So it was then you develop the, the, the kind of skill, if you like, of, of hiring good A&R people and trusting their judgment and, and empowering them to make decisions which they have to stand or fall by. Yeah, it, it's... Uh... That was a great answer, first of all, for, for, for you saying you don't really know how to answer it. But, but second of all... Um, don't, ask me, don't ask me any more of those. I want to know yeah. how to <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing that you said was you kind of have this naive belief that quality wins, right? Um, I do think that you can overthink that process, right? Like you can overthink if a work is quality or you can overthink um, about the audience. So you know, as quote unquote, as naive as quality wins, it does keep it simplistic enough where you can just answer the question, is this quality art or is it not, you know? Mm. Um, I also think that, and you can tell me if, if you have, um, if you think differently, but that you can recognize quality without necessarily loving it. So like there are plenty of artists that I'm like, wow, this is great music. Like this is, this is good music. Um, but I, it's just not, not for me, but it's great music, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, despite you not necessarily loving something or that an A&R loves something, I do think quality and understanding and where it can reach an audience could, um, you know, could be cross genre and could be cross taste. You sure. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, well, it goes back to the point I was trying to make earlier on where that's about, um, trusting your team, you know, finding mm -hmm. good people to work for you and, um, acknowledging, as you said, the quality in an artist that may not be to your taste or even in a genre of music that is your, your kind of cup of tea. But um, just, just exactly that, recognizing this is great and there's a way that this can work. And that um, absolutely applies. I think when you're running a bigger setup than, than the one I currently have, you know, that would have applied to my as I said, my previous jobs at Virgin Records and Chrysalis Music, I exercise a lot of those um, judgment calls. Right, right. Um, and kind of like piggybacking off of that, you've worked with artists from many different genres and territories. Uh, what do you think, I asked you in the beginning, you know, what do you think of the value sets that have afforded you the success that you've reached so far? What do you think are the value sets that are important for, for artists during their journeys? Well, I think it goes back to very similar things. Yeah, we can mm -hmm. boil things down um, to quite simple issues sometimes. Um, it's about having incredible belief in yourself and being true to yourself and, and not compromising um, and having kind of total uh, kind of blind ambition, just a, just a sense that nothing's going to get in my way. I'm going to get there some way, somehow or other, I'm going to get, and some people can express that in a very quiet way. Um, and some people it's much more kind of brazen and, and, mm -hmm. and kind of out there. But I think it's, it's tough. The music business is tough. And to be successful as an artist, you have to, you will inevitably have suffered an awful lot of knockbacks and falls before you get there. And if each time you get knocked back and, and fall over, you're not prepared to pick yourself up again, you ain't going to make it. You know, simply right. like you'll fall by the wayside. So you've got to have that determination. Um, and I've always um, worked with artists that I, I thought had a true vision of who they are. If an artist comes to me and says, well, what do you think I should do? Who do you think I should be? Should I, should I you know, be this sort of actor? Should I have this sort of image? As soon as they ask for that sort of question, I go, 
I'm the wrong person for you and you're the wrong person for me. There's other mm-hmm. people who do all that kind of total kind of uh, molding and structuring of, of, you know, the kind of uh, pre-packaged or whatever you want to call it, pop star thing. That's, they, and people do that very well. It's not something that I, I would, it's not something I want to do. Therefore, I wouldn't be any good at it. You know, and, yeah. and I just, I like working with artists who have a very clear sense of who they are. My job is to try and help them realize that goal, sometimes to steer them just a little bit, just a little bit left, a little bit right, if I feel like going slightly off direction, to make some suggestions, to try and stop them making bad decisions, just to throw in some bits of, of kind of thought-provoking um, opinion, whatever it may be, just to try and get the best out of them, but never to try and take them in a completely different direction. That's pointless. Right, right. A thousand percent. Well, in, in, I mean, throughout your experience, I'm curious, some of the artists you've worked with where you felt like they've either exemplified these values, or I know a lot of our listeners are just very keen for kind of uh, success stories and inflection points in the careers of other artists that they can really try and kind of extract and, and use as they're um, trying to navigate the waters. So thinking back, I know you've had exposure working with lots of different artists in a lot of different capacities, but if you had to pick some of the, the favorite artists you've worked with or um, where you feel like you've really seen like a, a strong ascent from being in this very developing, emerging stage into becoming a, a force to be reckoned with and, and truly established artists and like what really helps drive that transition and that growth? Let me think. I think probably the best story I can give you as an example of, of um, how it's not always easy is the, the career of David Gray. Um, now, Dave was an artist I signed originally to his first record deal when I was at Virgin Records in 1992. And we made one record together at Virgin, which was very unsuccessful, and then I left. And then he made another equally unsuccessful record for Virgin and then got dropped. He then got another record deal with EMI Records, which was they made a record which was really unsuccessful, got dropped. I'd meanwhile moved on to Chrysalis Music, and he he still remained a good friend of mine, and I still loved. I'd, I'd go see him play live, we'd hang out, whatever. So I knew he was still writing great songs, and I still believed in him. And I signed him to Chrysalis Music as if we did a publishing deal with him in 1996, and. Um, nobody would give him the time of day. He was like everything an artist would be expected to if their career has been washed up. Three albums, all unsuccessful, whatever. So he ended up making a record on his own, which we helped him with in, in one way or another as his publisher, um, both financially and other ways. But it was all done incredibly cheaply. And, and he put it out on his own little label, the one territory where he was um, able to play to a an audience of any number was Ireland. Um, even though he's not from, a lot of people thought he was Irish. Um, and when we put that, that album out, an album called White Ladder, um, we hoped we could sell enough records in Ireland to make him enough money to make another one. And well, that album was originally released in 1998 and it took two years for it to be successful, but it went on to sell, I think it's over eight or nine million copies now, White Ladder establish him as a major artist in the world. And, you know, one of the, my great highlights for me was um, going to New York to see him play a headline show, sold out headline show at Madison Square Gardens in front of 20 odd thousand people. And this is someone that a few years before couldn't have played to 20 people, you know. So, um, and I use that story as a illustration of two things. One, the music, that's out of fashion, won't stay out of fashion forever if it's good, and quality will come through, like I said earlier. And the other is is Dave himself, the artist, his, his self-belief. He knew he was good. He's not an arrogant guy. He just knew he was good, and he knew that eventually other people <laughs> would see that he was good. <laughs> so that was a, it was a long, you know, from when I first signed him in, in 92 to the year 2000 when he had his big breakthrough. That was eight years of seeing just wondering how the hell this was ever going to come right, but knowing that it would somehow. 
Um, that's probably the most extreme example I can give you of the things that illustrate various points I was making earlier. Um, and, um, you know, there's other artists I've, I've worked with who've had uh, similar barriers put up in front of them, similar amounts of disbelief that they'd actually make it. And then you just keep going. <laughs> you get that break eventually. That's awesome. You know, if you compare it to like um, the world outside of music, it'd be like getting fired from your dream job over and over and over again <laughs> and, st- and still like applying to new companies, <laughs> you know, and still and, and not saying like I'm a bad software engineer or I'm a bad a r but saying, you know, I have to, I have to keep going, you know, well, even better starting your own company and out doing the people who, who find right. you. <laughs> right. Exactly. Going yeah. to, going to do, do something at, a, at three different companies, yeah. Yeah. Uh, getting fired and then starting your own company that does the exact same thing and you're doing it better. Um, yeah, exactly that. That's amazing. That's awesome. That's yeah. really cool. Um, I also want to get into the story of how you uh, began working with Phoebe Bridgers. I think she's having like a really special moment right now. Um, I'm pretty sure she was nominated for a Grammy, right? This past, oh. These past Grammys. Um, four Grammys. She was four, four Grammys. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Four Grammys. Um, get it twisted, Jordan. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> any of them, like, didn't put any four. of them. One zero. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know, nominations are, are big in themselves, and I think I think culture knows how important she is right now. Um, yeah. I've seen I've seen her, um, you know, have songs with Maggie Rogers, but also Kid Cudi, you know, yeah. um, and she's she's really talented, special voice. So, kind of, how did that relationship come together? Um, and kind of, where do you, where, where, where did you see things going at the time? And how do you compare that to where she is now? Um, it's a, it's a simple story. I, I was out in LA in, let me get this right. It was in the early part of 2016. Um, and I reconnected with an old friend of mine who I'd known and liked a lot, a guy called Tony Berg, who's a record producer and a, and our guy and a musician and I hadn't seen Tony a few years and we kind of got back in touch and I went over to see him at his little home studio um, over in Brentwood where he lived at the time and he was working, Tony's one of the great enthusiasts of this world, he's a terrific guy and um, he was just telling about all these different artists he was working on and there's a load of young artists coming through LA that he'd, he'd taken under his wing and started recording all of the, the unsigned and he played me about eight or nine things, and one of them was Phoebe Bridges. And of all the things he played me, and all of which were pretty good, she just stood out. It's just just her voice and, and, and the songs and the emotion behind it, mm-hmm. and the miracle, the kind of word, the stuff that she was singing about. She was singing it. She was like barely 20 years old, I think, at that stage. Um, so I just kind of got really, just thought, my God, she's incredible. I want to work with this, this girl in some capacity. And it was just at the point when we were, um, I was doing all the stuff behind the scenes that led up to the deal by which we bought Chrysalis Records. So I didn't at that point have a vehicle to do anything with her. <laughs> you know, I didn't have yeah. a record label. I think she already had a publishing company or I, I don't think my publishing company was properly set up then. I can't remember that. And we were managers at that point, but she did have a manager. and. Um, about a year later, I got a call from, um, her manager, a great guy called Darren Harmon, who said, um, I'm just leaving the company that he's working for. Um, would you be interested in doing something together at my management company, Blue Ranker Artists? And I, and, and I've got Phoebe and I said, this sounds amazing. I love Phoebe. I wanted to work with her. <laughs> so the way we got into business was was um, for me to effectively lure Darren into working as part of Blue Raincoat under our management business, Blue Raincoat Artists, where I said to him, you can do exactly what you do, but we will give you the support of, of our team. We can give you an assistant. We can give you... Um, someone to help you with the logistics. We'll do all your admin for you. I'll be there to help in whatever way I can, whatever that may be. We'll, and just so you're not doing it all on your own. Um, mm-hmm. So so Darren came to to join us at Blue Ray Carters, bringing Phoebe with him. And that's how we've been in business. And, and this was all um, 
I think it was just at the time that Strange and the Outs of her first album was coming out. Um, but we didn't know whether it was the level of success we were going to have. We just thought it's a great record and she's a great artist. And then the story has grown from there, you know. And uh, right. I think she is one of the most important, relevant artists in the in the music world right now. I think she's an extraordinary talent. Yeah, um, I agree. And she's she's still so young, such an amazing future ahead of her. She's also, it's one of the musically talented. She's just got that instinctive knack of knowing how to connect with, with an audience and how to engage um, with an audience. Um, one of the, the best in a subtle way users of social media as a way to keep to keep her her relationship with her fans very very buoyant and alive and uh yeah i know she's a joy to work with absolute joy that's special i love that um well i, I guess one one question too is as you have tons of experience across different labels management uh management indie massive the, the whole spectrum um it, it very much seems like in the, the recent years, decade, especially, there's just been this growing wave of like independence. It, it is interesting because you do look at like Billboard 100 and like still like the vast, vast majority of any song that really does make it to to that level has some level of backing by some major label, um, whether through a JV, an imprint, whatever it may be. Regardless, it, there's uh, major labels have gotten their hands on it and help help push it to that realm. I'm curious from your perspective when it comes to like deal points and uh, kind of the, the fairness or giving more leverage and power back to artists, how have you seen record label contracts evolve and what do you anticipate in the coming years with regards to giving artists a bit more power than they may have had historically? Well, it's a good question and it's one I think I do have an answer for, or I'll try to at any rate. Um, I, we're both blessed and cursed by the fact that we are artist managers. And by that, I mean, I now can't do any deal, which, whether we're acting as the record company or publishing company or whatever, that I wouldn't accept if I was the artist's manager, if you, if you see what I mean. So um, I always like to think I was pretty fair and very pro-artist in my previous jobs. But the fact of the matter is, both at Virgin and Chris's Music, they weren't my companies. I was working for someone else. So I, I, could, I had a lot of scope to be myself, but I was still having to abide by the company rules as to what I could and couldn't do in terms of the kind of deals I could offer them. Um, the, right now, I think we, we've just, it's very simple in terms of record contracts, and I make no secret of this. On our um, deals that we now make when we sign new artists to Christmas Records, they're very simple agreements. Um, their 50-50 net profit deal, very transparent. The artist is um, involved in the decision over every dollar that is spent because 50 cents of that is theirs if they're on the, that net profit. When I say the artist, the artist or their representative. So it is about trying to um, forge partnerships with, with artists rather than having a sort of, you know, um, kind of land grab and, and sort of master servant type relationship. Um, I think, you know, you go back, you look at the, you trace back record contracts. And in fact, when we bought Christmas records, there's a lot of contracts in that um, company that go back to the sixties and you look at the, the terms and they're just, you know, you just shake your head in disbelief at how terrible the terms that were being offered to the artists were. So in, in, in many of those cases, we've improved um, specifically the royalty rates and how, how artists earn from their, their works. Um, and again, a, a, another a key point in all our deals, increasingly so now, is that we never have full-term copyright deals. We always have the rights of the artist's work reverting back to them after a certain period of time. That would not have been the case in hardly any of the early record deals. Um, and it's been pointed out by a load of people how, how unfair that is when you've had massive success. Um, people equate it to like, you know, if you, if you take out a mortgage to buy a house and you paid off the mortgage, you, you own the ha a house. But that's not how it works in, in the old record deals. You still are stuck forever with, in a relationship with that company, whether you like it or not. 
uh, which I think is pretty indefensible. Um, so you look at, uh, you try and look at things in the round. You try and look at things and 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 see what's fair. Uh, and as I said, the the, um, the reality check is always: Would I advise my client, if I was the manager, to do that deal? And if the answer is no, then I wouldn't offer it to someone. <laughs> you know? Right. And I think also when you think like that and you also offer the type of deals that you offer and they're true partnerships, those things can't get in the way or they don't get in the way of like the creativity of the artist and like making good music. You know, um, I don't have any experience with this, but I would assume if there was sort of this master servant relationship, like you were talking about earlier, the pressure on the artist may change the, the, the product. It may change the result, you know, uh, but true partnerships allow for the artist to go into the studio and know that they are in a great relationship with their partner and that they can create the best work that they want to create, you know? Well, for the most part, an artist's creativity comes from a very special place that, that if I, I'm not an artist, so I, mm-hmm. I don't, I just kind of look in awe and wonder at people who can create these moments of magic. You know, <laughs> yeah, me too. Which part of them does it, does it all come from? So yeah. it's kind of, to, to a large degree, separate from the business relationship. But of mm-hmm. course, the two spill over. And if an artist is feels that they are being um, ripped off, exploited, um, mm-hmm. undervalued, any of those things, it's an unpleasant place to be. Now, some actually, some great art can come out of that sort of anger. <laughs> yeah, true, very true. Art, <laughs> not something that... You know, it's not a it's not a, a healthy environment for anyone to create mm-hmm. uh, or, or to try and operate within. So, of course, um, trying to have a kind of harmonious um, relationship, to my mind, is pretty important. You know, you, you want to work with your artists, not against your artists. Yeah, so, <laughs> but, just, you know, just be smart about it. <laughs> be, that's all I'd say. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, for coming on the Music Business Podcast. You dropped a lot of gems, and I'm I'm sure you know when people get to the intro of this episode, they'll be really excited to to hear it. So hope you hope you enjoyed yourself. Yeah, that was fun. Enjoyed it. Thanks, both of you. Awesome. Good questions in there. <laughs> we ch- we try. We try. You only, you only <laughs> fooled me completely once. That's not too bad. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. All right, All right, Jeremy. Appreciate you. Right. You have a good one. Thanks a lot. See you later. Yeah, man. I mean, that was uh, that was really great. I, I know, you know, me, me and you were reading his bio when we were coming up with the questions before the interview. We had to confirm a few things because we were like, man, this is is this guy the shit like this? Like, is he for real? <laughs> like, is all this stuff true? <laughs> is he flexing this hard? <laughs> right, right. Um, or is Wikipedia front? Right. And confirmed he is the shit. He knows yeah, a lot. He, of, he knows a lot. <laughs> yeah, He's had a long, fruitful career. Um, and it was definitely great to to get him on. I think that um, talking about partnerships at the end of the discussion there and how um, over time labels have really become partners with artists and not necessarily have the uh, you know master servant relationship. So it was it was really cool to hear his approach to that. To hear that he doesn't offer deals that he as a manager wouldn't sign himself. I think with that you only get great business partners. Um, and then the rest is just leaving it up to to your ear and to make sure you you, you sign artists that um, sell records and, and artists that you love. So, yeah, what do really? you think, Sam? Yeah, I thought it was great. I mean, I'm really excited to see this kind of continued evolution of like artist terms. I love how he really led with integrity as some of the core values that have helped him um, grow. And even for artists, whether it's integrity and, and kind of follow through or just integrity and staying true to yourself and your brand. I think from an artist perspective, from a music industry professional perspective, um, if you really nurture those with a sense of curiosity and drive, I think that's going to put you in a great place. So really appreciate Jeremy for coming out. He's doing incredible work. Be sure to look him up, follow him. Um, and on that note, we'll, we'll be out. It's been, been a pleasure. Always is, always will be. We'll be back next week. Until then, peace. Peace.